so good to be with you this evening. And I trust that everybody is doing all, all right. And if you're not, you're going to do all right very shortly. How is that? Yeah, we're going to do all right very shortly. Well, I want to say those things because I believe them. And uh, I, as uh, Pastor Stan would say sometimes, oh, that's just something that old, some old preacher said. And we all laugh about it. But uh, this, is, this is not just some old preacher talk, right? We're going to all be all right. We're going to get through these things. Uh, one of the things that God does, he allows us to go through difficulties because this is our last uh, stop for difficulty. Yeah, this is our, our first and last stop. We're, we're not going to have this after the, this. we get through this transitionary period. No, no, we're not going to have this kind of stuff. We're not going to have this opportunity to learn anything. Yeah, because sin is going to be dealt with, and we will have put off this, this carnality, this carnal flesh, as it were, the flesh, and we will be what we are supposed to be right now. We're going to be that without any hindrance at all. And that's what God is looking for. So go through this stuff. Uh, I mean, it's not fun. Go through it. And don't practice suffering, suffering avoidance. Don't practice it. Don't practice it. Yeah? Yeah, don't practice it. Trying to get out of everything you can get out of, all right? Let's don't do that. So that's sort of a little prelude to what I'm going to try to share tonight uh, from a, a title, Transformed into His Image. Transformed into His Image. And we know the image is Jesus, right? It is... Uh, and uh, we, know, we know also that, that uh, our life is a process. It's a process, right? And that means that, that God uses these series of, of various actions uh, because he has a goal in mind. And that is that we're going to be experientially all that he desires us to be. We're going to be it experientially, right? That means that we're going to walk in it. It's going to be our experience, all that God wants to be. Sonship, God wants us to experience it. And some, so often, uh, working these things out just causes us a lot of issues because we think if God loved me, he would never allow me to suffer. No, because God loves you, he is going to bring you through it. He's going to allow it in your life because he loves you. Uh, you can't say, if God loved me, why is this happening? You know, Jesus never uh, asked that question. Or made that statement. You know, do, do you love me? You know, Jesus went through it because he knew that it was the will of God. And so I want us to go through this process because God is doing this in a, or allowing this, causing this, however your faith can handle. Uh, this systematic series of actions that, that are bringing us to a place where we, we're going to see who we really are. We're going to see who we really are. Uh, let's look at Romans chapter 12, verses uh, 1 and 2. Let's look at them. Uh, Paul says to the Romans, and thus he says to us, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, that's very big, isn't it? So he is going to beseech them, I'm begging of you, I'm imploring you, by the mercies of God, by the tenderness of God, that you present your bodies, give God your bodies as a living sacrifice, you know, a living sacrifice. Your bodies are, are not your own, right? So you are to present them as a living sacrifice. I am willing to go through whatever you desire me to go through. I am willing. Not, not, I'm, I'm not saying go through those things that you created. So there is a big difference. But those things that you have, you have wanted, I am a living sacrifice, holy, that is set apart, acceptable to God. I'm set apart and I'm acceptable to God. He says, which is your reasonable service? So it is the reasonable thing to do after all that God has done for us that he sent his only begotten son that we should not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. And so God did that. The innocent suffering for the guilty. God did that. He says, so Paul says, it's the reasonable thing you ought to do. And we can make it lofty if, if we want, but he says, Come on, guys, get it right. That's what you ought to do. You know, that's your reasonable service is to give God your person, who you are. Give him that. And then uh, Paul says, and be not or and do not be conformed to this world. So we know that the pressure uh, of the world is to make us conform or to mold you. 
So, so the, the opposition wants to mold you into something other than what God wants for you. He wants to mold you. The pressures of life, uh, the, the enemy's desire is to mold you. That is to make you so angry that you say something that you shouldn't have said. Or to, to kind of uh, smooth, smooth your emotions, your feelings, until you, you feel like doing something you should not do. So he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So he's not saying to you that, that by willpower you should change yourself. But he says, be transformed. Allow God to make you into what he wants. That is, this is the same word for transfiguring. Be changed into what God desires. Be trans. And how are you transformed? He says, by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. So then I am saved. I am now being saved in my mind, in my soul, my, my, my intellect, my will, my emotions. That, that is being saved. So he says, by renewing of your mind. So God is interested in changing the way you think, and the way you think will change the way you act. So that's what God is interested in. So, so this is what he said, being transformed into his image. So God does have a model that he's using, and that model is Jesus. All right? He's changing you into Jesus. I've heard people say things like, well, I'm not God. No, you're not God, but you're supposed to be like him, and you're a child of God. I, I walked in there, and, and, and one brother said to me, he's always kind of messing with me because he's kind of strong physically, I think. But he said, no, my weapons are... Uh, are, are not carnal. <laughs> but he said, hey, walking like Orlean, huh? <laughs> My dad. Walk, yes, that's exactly right. Walking like Orlean. And you and I are to walk like Jesus. And the way you walk like God, the Father, you must walk like Jesus because Jesus is the pattern son. So in all, we need to read, when we read our Bible, we're not trying to read the Bible how to secretly tell that person off who's messing with us. And still go to heaven. No, but we're reading our Bible to see Jesus everywhere. You must see Jesus everywhere. And once you see Jesus, you can't unsee him. And what we want you to do and what God wants you to do is to walk like the Father by walking like Jesus. Wow. Amen. And he says... You know, and don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to get your thinking right, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you're going to prove. And uh, when, when I was a boy, my dad used prove differently than I did. I, I used it superficially, obviously, but my dad would, would use prove as in uh, test a thing to, to realize its authenticity. So that's how he would do it. If he says, I'm going to go out here and prove this, uh, this horse, then we had to prove the horse to see if the horse was worth what he, we paid for it. So when we talk about that you may prove, that is that you may find out by testing what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. See, the content of Paul's urging uh, is uh, to offer your body, my body, as a living sacrifice. Oftentimes we think our body belongs to us. Although we're Christians, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, we still think our bodies belong to us. But our bodies belong to God. When I was a boy, I used to sing a song, uh, uh, my body belongs to, to God. I think that's how it went. He said, my body, my soul and body, my soul and body belong to, to God. My soul and body belong to God. And I used to sing, I didn't know, remember, I didn't rather know that I was listening to those songs because I couldn't sing well, so I didn't sing. And, and so now that I'm, you know, a lot older than our dear young sister back there, I'm a lot older than, than she, uh, those songs keep coming to my, my memory. They just keep coming back. He says, I, I belong to God. Holy, totally. My soul and my, and my body belong to God. Now, the spirit already is his. The spirit is already his. So I don't, I'm not confessing. I, it's already a done work. It's a done work. It's a complete work. I am saved. That's in, a, in, the, in my heart, in my new heart. I am saved. I'm not being saved there. I'm being saved here. And I will be saved here. 
but I'm already saved there. There's nothing wrong in there where Jesus lives. Nothing wrong in that, in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. So your body, you must see your body. We're being transformed into his image. So you must see your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Wow. You are a temple. I know sometimes we say things like, oh, my, uh, my body is, is the temple. And we say it so casually, I wonder if we really get it. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, now, do you, does God live in an unclean temple? I would say to you, no, absolutely. The place in us where God really resides and is doing his work from that place, that place is, is, is holy and righteous. Now, Paul is urging us to conduct our, our entire being that way. He is saying uh, your whole being that way. Recognize that you, that you are God's temple and the Holy Spirit resides in you. And so uh, when you think about Paul saying that to us about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, it probably br brings to mind those of you who study the Word of God, the Old Testament uh, sacrifices. You know, they brought that animal, that to, that, that animal totally to, to, uh, to be sacrificed. And they brought that animal, they gave it to, to the priest, it was to be without blemish, without spot. And so you and I must endeavor to be a, a person without blemish, not make peace treaties with your weaknesses. So we, let us not do that, right? Why? Because God uh, has us in process. We are being transformed into the image of Christ. Now, let's look at this a little bit more. So the totality of your life and all of your activities of which the body is the vehicle of expression should belong to God. So I express my love for God in the, through this body. I do. So when I obey God, I am showing God how much I love him because my obedience is the outward manifestation of my love for him. Amen. Are you with me? All right, super. So let us ex explore more of what Paul is saying. So, um, so, so um, in contrast to what the Old Testament was about, your bodies are living bodies. So that means that, Paul, as Paul said, I die daily. So that means you, you, you survived a day. I like it when somebody says, oh, 70 years old or 70 years young or 75 years or 80 years or 85 years. I think that's good because that means that you've been victorious. And so here, here, your body is to be a living sacrifice. And so, so this offering, you offering God your body that is, it is set apart and it is pleasing to God, is holy or you know, it's holy, Holy Spirit, holy body, right? It is acceptable and well-pleasing. And then he says transformed. So you and I are being transformed. We are being changed. We are being uh, transfigured, as it, as it were. You know, when Jesus was transfigured on, the mount, on that mountain that day, um, and uh, Moses and Elijah came to him, they were uh, witnessing. It was the law and the prophets there witnessing, I, I think, actually bowing to Jesus to say, hey, you know, you, you, you're what we were talking about. You know, you are the, you are the, uh, I prophesied about you. And, uh, and the law was, uh, was about you because Christ is the end of the law to all who believe, all who have faith. And so he says, and so as they were doing that, Jesus was transfigured. And he, Peter, uh, James, and John saw him in his heavenly glory. They had never seen anything like that. They had never seen anything like that. And Peter just, he was, he was a different kind of a guy. You always want a friend like Peter. Yeah, you want a friend like Peter because he would say the thing you're thinking. <laughs> yeah, he gets caught, but, but you were thinking it too. So, so I'm sure James and John were thinking too, let's do something. And that's sort of how that is. But, but uh, when Peter says, let's, he saw Jesus being transfigured. Um, uh, he, he was changed there right in front of him. He said, let's do something. Let, let, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, Lord, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Let's bring all three of you 
God says, boy, be quiet. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Hear him. Hear him. Hear what he has to say. And this is what God wants us to do. So as we look at the transfiguration of Jesus, then we can see through the scriptures what God wants of each of us. That is... Uh, that is, Paul says in these verses that we are, not allow the, we are not to allow the world to mold us into the shape it wants, but we are to be transformed, changed, transfigured in our minds by our thinking so then we can show now through our personhood what is good, what is acceptable, and perfect will of God. Amen. That's what Paul is saying to us. So you can't unless you are changed in the way you think. I find a lot of believers have the yes, but attitude. Yeah. Uh, our thinking should now, is, is now shaped now what? by the indwelling Holy Spirit. I share it with you just briefly that there is a place in every believer where God lives, God resides. I wanted to share a, a bit about that today, but I'll do it on, on Sunday. But this is what... Uh, where you and I are to get our, as it were, information. We're to get our information so that God will inform our minds, our thinking, until our thinking is like God and it's not worldly. All the worldliness is falling off. I find that, that the more I pray, the more I pull aside to be with the Lord, I have greater trials. It's like, you know, things start to, to pump up always coming to against me, against me. And so initially I'm thinking, hey, you know, I'm doing all this. I'm fasting. I'm praying. I'm doing everything. Well, yes, son, that's why the, the enemy's coming against you. He doesn't want you to look over that wall. He doesn't want the, the glass on the inside where, where God dwells and, and the angelic host dwelling. He doesn't want that to become clearer to you. No. So, but I'm looking through the glass. What Paul says, we look through there darkly or dimly. We look through the glass and we're trying to make some things out. I, I am seeing it more clearly. And so, therefore, the enemy is trying to stop that. He doesn't want you to see more clearly. He wants you to be attached to this world. And Paul says, no, don't be attached to this world. Don't let the world shape you like it wants you to be. But be different. And how do you do that? By allowing the Holy Spirit to tell you, no, love them. Wow. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not the only person in this room tonight who has been mistreated. I've been mistreated by some people who never should have mistreated me. Never should have said things or did the, the, the things. But you, and I, I sure wanted God to get them. You, know, you ever want God to get them? You want God to get them. Or you, you, you just get them. God. But no, you know, what the Lord, you know how God gets them? He said, now you go and love them. Boy, I'm telling you. That's how God gets them. You know, and if you don't go love them, God, God didn't get them. Not through you anyway. You missed an opportunity. And I don't want to ever miss any opportunities. I don't want to miss an opportunity to love somebody who needs love. Because we don't know the whole story. We don't know what made them so mean. We don't know that. And so, so what God says, you go love them. Show them who I am. Come on, don't let the world shape you. Don't let that attitude mold you. Wow. So that's how God is doing it. So, so let's look at, at 1 John chapter 3, um, verses 1 and 2. Let's look at those. I've, I've been reading those uh, quite often. And I'm going to be reading them quite often in the days to come as well because I want us to grasp something that I am not sure we are grasping. I want us to grasp this. I want us to hold it. I want us to so hold it until it holds us. Amen. You know? Right? I want us to do that. Let's read First John 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. You know, now call children of God is not like calling a tree a rock. I think sometimes our, our thinking is not quite what it ought to be. It's saying it's that we should be called what God has named us, what God has brought us forth to be. We have been engendered by God, brought forth by God in the Spirit. James says that, um, that by his own will, He's brought us forth to be a type of first fruits of his creatures. But, but, but there's something deeper there than that. Of his own will, 
he engendered us. It was his own will that brought Jesus Christ. And he's brought us the same way through the Holy Spirit. That's big. But the, the, the big difference is, and I've been sharing a little bit with staff a little, but what the a big difference is, is that is that when I was brought into the world, you were brought into the world, we had no idea. Yeah, we cried out, but we didn't know what we were doing. You know, you know, like maybe, maybe I felt, I felt the comfort of my mom's womb, and then I came out in this big wide open space. Maybe that's why I cried. I don't know. But, but in, in, in this birth, I'm watching things happen. I'm watching a transformation. I'm cognizant of it all. And I'm becoming something that seems contrary to, that is contrary to that old nature. It is amazing what God is doing. And you and I have not seen the full extent of what God is doing. If you say, oh, I got it, you don't have it. And God may send somebody to say, hey, somebody, somebody just walks up and says, you don't have it. Wouldn't that be, be tough? It would scare you, right? Look here. Behold what manner of love. So what Paul, uh, John is saying here is that the love that God has bestowed upon us is greater than you can comprehend. It's greater than you can comprehend. You, you have no idea. I have no idea. I'm gaining some ideas about it. But I've had no idea of this love that God bestowed, that you are now called God's own uh, children. You know, and, and, and the Spanish, you know, when you use uh, the, the, the ownership word, I think is propio, uh, right? It's propio. You know, you can be a child, but then it's, it's propio. Uh, the child, you are their own. So in this context, you and I are his own children. We're not kind of like his children. We're his own children. Because why? We have been born again now. So we are his own children. It, 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 these things are so good, you can't just flippantly say them. You can't go out there and just casually throw these things around. They are too precious. And then somebody's going to contest you because they don't have enough faith to believe that God engendered us. God brought us forth by, by an act of the Spirit of God. We, were, we, had, we experienced a new birth. So this is very big. So we are being transformed to actually walk all of that out on, in this pleasant, present world. Now look, he said, we're called children of God. It's like uh, my mom named me Donald. Marva named me Don. So, so I go by Don, right? right? So, but, but, so I was known as Donald, uh, Donald, unless you were one girl who said Don Donald, but I was Donald. And so I, it, it wasn't like, oh, they just used that, that to just somehow, uh, it was meaningless, and, and I would answer, answer to Richard. No, I only answered to Donald. And so I answer to Don. I also answer to Pastor, my, my son says. He says, he said, Dad, 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 I don't move. And then he says, Pastor, I go. <laughs> yeah. So this is what he says. Therefore, we're called children of God. So that is our name. We are children of God. You know, well, one day we're going to be. No, we are children of God. He says, therefore, the world does not know us. So stop trying to curry favor with the world. And many Christians are doing that. I'm, I'm on a mission at this juncture. I'm on a mission to, to free the captives. And I want you to join me and be on a mission to free the captives. We have a lot of brothers and sisters who sit with us every, every time the doors open almost, but they are captives. They are conflicted. They have worldly pursuits and interests. I'm not talking about working to feed your family. You're supposed to do that. That's not a worldly interest. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. A lot of people need to learn that. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Now, notice, notice the, the clarity here. Because the world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. The, the world, the, the world uh, uh, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you, if you had known me, you would have known my dad. So listen, we're being transformed. He says, he says the, the world does not know us. So when the world knows you and understands you, then you're in trouble. 
I don't want the world to know me. I used to want the world to like me. I felt ostracized. I felt set apart, aside rather. Wow, what do I have to do? Then I raised children who, who did not mix well with the world. I won't say much more about that. But when the world says, I love you, I like what you are, then you've got an issue. Listen, he says. And so Paul, uh, John goes on to explain it like this. He says, beloved, now, at this moment, now, we are children of God. Uh, let's stay there for a moment. Right now. And this is not in some cloudy way that we have to try to, oh, yes, I'm a child of God like, no, I am a personal child of God. God is our father. God is our dad. God, Ye Yehovah, Yahweh, he's our dad. He brought us forth. That's, that's amazing. I understand that more today, clearer today than ever. He says, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. What John is saying is, it's not saying he doesn't know. John is saying it's so big that, it, that his amazing comprehension is not great enough to contain it. That's what John is saying. I don't want you to walk around in a daze and, 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 and wonder, Boy, uh, uh, I know what pastor said about being a child of God, but I don't get it. Try to get it. Come on, try to get it. Look at what John says. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. He said, but we know. This is what God has given us assurance of through the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. We know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him exactly like him for we shall see him as he is this is too good to dismiss it this is too good to go on to the next thing this is too good to say yes but what are we going to have after church tonight where are we going to go eat it's too good when he is revealed the moment he comes all that we are naturally falls off all of corruption falls off and what we are left is the fruit of righteousness. That's all that's left. I see it. I pray God to give me articulation. Let, let me say something quickly, and then, and then we're, we're going to release you. Not quite release you. This is how you practically walk it out. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Paul says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. This is a command that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. You should not be doing the same things that the Gentiles are doing. You can't come to church every, every time the doors open or every Sunday and you refuse to marry that woman. You just want to live with it. Te lastima. Can't walk like that. You're not a person of God. Walking like that. Well, I, I believe. No, it's not you. You got eye trouble, buddy. So don't talk to me until you get the glasses of the Word of God. You need some spectacles. Or you feel like cussing is, is a present help. In the time of anger. So you should no, not walk. You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. In the futility of their mind, empty-minded. Having their understanding darkened. Being alienated from the life of God. Because of the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness. That means obscene, indecent behavior. Lustful. Uncleanness. 
to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him. If indeed you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. So when the word of God is preached, that's Jesus talking to you. And let me just say, but while I'm on the subject, if the man is not convicted and the preacher pours a word and he gets convicted, don't you excuse it? Just don't cooperate with sinful behavior. We are the temple of God. This temple is holy. It's set apart for God. And that's how we affect the world. We don't just affect the world by public policy. We don't affect the world by, by congressional laws. All we do is kick the can down the road. We affect the world by our conduct, our comportment. We are the light of the world, not the Congress or the Senate. Who, who gets in charge of the Senate means there's darkness from the left or the darkness from the right. Why can't we see it? We are being transformed into the image of Christ. That's what God wants us to do. And we put off all of our carnality. Wow. Why? What does he say? They, they, they are ignorant. They're aliens from the life of God. And some of us act like aliens and we need to be rescued. Their past feelings have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness, uncleanliness with greediness. But you've not so learned Christ. Verse 22 says you, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, the old man, what I used to be, which grows corrupt corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So it doesn't just mean that you're, that you're watching something else or somebody else and you're lusting. You, you're so messed up that you've got that factory working inside you. It's like a factory. Don't listen to anybody who says, pastor's too hard. If anything, I'm too easy. We have to be that light, that transformed light. And then he says here, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Have a different attitude than your neighbors, your unsaved neighbors. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what God wants. So I won't finish this, but let me just say, let's walk like our dad. I didn't want to want to, want to walk like my dad because dad was kind of bow-legged and I was bow-legged until I had my knees operating on. But I would walk like my daddy would walk and I didn't want to walk like that because I wanted to be a, more, more cool than that. I wanted to walk like my worldly friends walk. But now when I wake up and I walk down the hall and I hit that side and this side and I'm trying to walk straight and all of a sudden I hit it again. I smile and I say, I'm just like my dad. Wouldn't it bless God's heart if he were to see us walking just like Jesus walked? Because that's walking like your dad. Of his own will, he brought you forth. God wanted you. You were not an unexpected birth. He wanted you. I'll be back in a minute. God bless.